This is Democracy Now! As we talk about the report, the 3,000-page report, uh, almost a decade um, in the making, uh, we are joined by two leading IPCC scientists. And we go to Bangladesh to speak as well with Salim Haq, climate scientist, director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. He's been a longtime IPCC lead author, now joining us from Dhaka. Your response to this report, Salim? Thank you very much, Amy. <clears throat> My response is that this uh, report has actually um, ushered in what I call the new era of loss and damage from human-induced climate change in an absolutely scientifically verifiable and attributable manner. There is no question at all that what we are seeing on our TV screens across the world in terms of the wildfires, the heat, heat the dome effect in the North America, floods in China and India, are now the severity of all of these have been increased because of human-induced climate change by re enhancing the global temperature 1.2 degrees above uh, pre-industrial. And the path to keeping it below 1.5 degrees is diminishing by the hour, as Greta Thunberg said. Did anything surprise you in this report, Salim? And describe specifically what's happening in Bangladesh. So this is not a surprising report. It's an assessment of, as you've heard, 14,000 scientific papers, which already exist and we've known about. Uh, it brings it all together uh, and, and makes the case for urgency, I think, very, very strong. Um, the new aspect of it, I would say, has, has already been uh, alluded to by one of the lead authors, is that the science on attribution of extreme events has become a lot better. It used to be the case that these extreme weather events that we have could not be tied to human-induced climate change uh, as they are now able to be done. So the heat dome effect in North America, for example, could not have happened without the human-induced climate change taking place. The severity of the wildfires in southern Europe would not be so severe without human-induced climate change, and so on and so forth. These events are not caused by climate change, but they are becoming much, much, much more severe because of human-induced climate change having already raised global mean temperature by 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial. So in Bangladesh, where I live, we've known this for over a decade. This is all old news. None of this is new news. It happens all the time. We are a country of 170 million people living on less than 150,000 square kilometers um, on the delta of two of the world's biggest rivers, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, and also uh, susceptible to a major cyclones coming in from the Bay of Bengal uh, into hitting our country. So we've seen uh, just a year ago, a year and a bit ago, a super cyclone hit us called Amphan on, uh, in May of 2020. It became a super cyclone while it was in the Bay of Bengal because the sea surface temperature was two degrees above normal. Um, in past decades, super cyclones of that magnitude have actually killed hundreds of thousands of people. The good news is they don't anymore. Bangladesh has probably the best cyclone warning and evacuation system in the whole world. Three million people were evacuated and took shelter. And the death rate was in the few dozens of people, most of whom were fishermen who were out at sea and didn't get back to land in time. Three million people on land took shelter and survived. But nevertheless, the cyclone did a lot of damage. People lost their homes their crops, their livelihood, infrastructure. So even though the death rate has been brought down considerably, the, de the destruction was not able to be prevented. And there'll be more of that coming in the future. Salim Haq, um, the biggest greenhouse gas emitters are China and the United States. Uh, what do these two countries have to do? These two countries are the key. The United States is still, even though China is the biggest greenhouse ga gas emitter now, the United States is still cumulatively the biggest contributor to the fact that we now have global temperature above 1.2 degrees centigrade. So both these countries are going to have to step up their game. And to me, they are key. If they can do it, everybody else will follow. They've done some. One must give credit for that. But they haven't done enough. 
And hopefully this report will spur them on to take even faster, more drastic action to wean themselves off fossil fuels on coal, petroleum and natural gas as quickly as possible and segue into a cleaner energy world of renewable energies like solar, wind, uh, together with storage, which is a key factor in utilizing these uh, intermittent energy sources like uh, wind and solar. Uh, with these three technologies, we should be able to wean ourselves off fossils very quickly and go into a new world based on renewable energies. The faster we do that, the better off everybody, including Americans and Chinese, will be. America and Chinese, China are also quite vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, as they just found out in the last few weeks. So they're not going to be able to uh, uh, adapt as quickly either. So the sooner they can reduce their emissions, the better. And the rest of the world will follow. They are the two key players. Let me put this question to Robert Kopp. You have these massive issues of extreme weather. Um, you have the western wildfires, California, Oregon, Washington, and yet it's Denver, Colorado, that experiences the worst air quality in the world of any major city this weekend because of those fires in the West. Uh, you have the fires in Greece, the flooding in Bangladesh, where Salim al Haq is. Um, is this the best we can hope for in the future? Is there any way to even uh, mitigate against these kind of extreme weathers? Is this as good as it gets? You know, what we're basically facing is a world with about 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming. And so, even if we're you know, looking forward, we're talking about one and a half or two degrees C. And what we can say is that every increment of warming is going to make these sorts of impacts more severe. So in order to stop things from getting worse, we need to get, uh, as my colleague was saying, we need to get global greenhouse gas emissions to net zero, which requires a global effort. Um, and you know, these, these sorts of changes we see are basically what we see with the level of warming that we have. And you know, we're not coming back to this level of warming. So, so these are indeed going to get worse. But I think it's important for us to bear in mind that we have very real control over how much worse they get. Professor Cobb, you are a specialist, and you've done a lot of work around preserving coral reefs in the world. Can you talk about the effects of climate change on these coral reefs and why this is so significant, an indicator of what's happening all over the world, even outside the coral reefs? Yes. The report flagged as an incredibly vulnerable ecosystem uh, to current warming levels as well as future warming levels. Uh, corals live in a relatively narrow temperature tolerance where if that uh, temperature is exceeded, uh, they bleach first, and that's something that has hit the headlines in recent years. And if they, uh, those conditions persist for even a matter of weeks, uh, the corals will die. And in 2016, we had a uh, global scale a marine heat wave associated with one of the largest El Nino events on record, which is a uh, natural climate cycle that, when superimposed on current warming levels of just over one degrees, uh, was enough to bring to our records uh, this historic coral bleaching and mortality event that swept every tropical ocean basin in the world. And so many of us who study coral reefs uh, were taken aback by just how quickly these extreme temperatures are at our doorstep and the absolutely devastating losses that reefs incurred in that year, uh, a real wake-up call with respect to the ongoing risks on reef systems. It's really important to remember that these reef systems are critical to the economies of so many uh, island nations and tropical nations around the world and provide the vast source of protein for over a billion people. Mm. Uh, Professor Salim al Haq, I wanted to ask you about these massive uh, incidents of um, extreme weather, um, the floods in Europe and South Asia, the wildfires in Greece, the United States, as well as Siberia. Um, can you talk about how so often in the past we saw this in poorer countries, but now we're seeing it in the industrialized world repeatedly, relentlessly. This, can you talk about the change in media coverage because of that? 
Absolutely. So, uh, as I said earlier, in Bangladesh and indeed in the rest of the global south, uh, this is not news at all. We've known this for the last decade. We've been suffering. We've been uh, dealing with it as best we can uh, with the rest of the global media uh, not taking much interest, maybe a few seconds to report on a, on a flood or a drought or a, a hurricane, and that was it. Uh, now that it's happening in the rich world, in Europe and in the United States, um, it's get, getting a lot more wall-to-wall -wall television coverage. I've been watching TV all day here in Dhaka about the Greek uh, wildfires in Greece. I'm sure the Greeks never saw a wall-to-wall -wall coverage of what happened in Bangladesh when we had floods and cyclones. Uh, so that's a good thing, you know, in, in uh, everybody now realizing we're in the same boat uh, and, and uh, facing the same storm, even if we're not all in exactly the same kind of boat. Uh, but uh, one of the interesting issues here is what the rich countries can actually learn from the poorer countries like Bangladesh. I mentioned that Bangladesh has brought down the death rate of these events in a very, very significant fashion by providing early warning and evacuation for people. The number of deaths that we saw in Germany, in one of the richest countries in the world, nearly 200 Germans actually died from flash floods, would never have happened in Bangladesh. We would have evacuated them. We do evacuate everybody that's in the path of floods or in cyclones. In Germany, they weren't able to do that. So Germany could learn a lot from Bangladesh, and so could the United States, on how to deal with these impacts that they have not been used to, but we are used to doing them. As we wrap up, Salim Haq, if you can talk about the significance of the climate summit that's taking place in Glasgow, if, in fact, it happens as an in-person event or just a virtual one because of COVID, um, but the significance of this summit. I think the uh, Glasgow summit, the COP26, is going to be perhaps the most significant COP that we've had. Uh, just a reminder that this was actually supposed to have been held last year, in December 2020, and it got postponed because of the COVID-19 pandemic for valid reasons. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, didn't allow it to be held, so it was postponed by 12 months. But that's a very critical 12 months, because climate change didn't take 12 months off. It's actually taking place, and I would say it actually crossed a threshold, which we've just seen with the IPCC 6 assessment report, that we are now living in a climate change world. And so, as I said, we are now in the era of having to deal with loss and damage from human-induced climate change. And that's going to be one of the topics that the vulnerable countries are going to bring up. Indeed, they've already brought it up in COP26 for treating it seriously, which has not been done so far. We've been talking about it for a long time. We've not been getting anywhere with it. Now it's for the rich countries to recognize it's a reality and do what they're supposed to do, which is implement what they agreed to implement in Paris, keep the global temperature below 1.5 degrees and provide $100 billion a year to the developing countries to tackle climate change. They promised but didn't deliver.